Okay, so Year 12s, we're going to go on with Section 2, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and every section of the novel, I want you to think about the symbolic significance of the title of each section. Um, so in Section 1, the theatre, we had King Lear and the um, end of the world moment, I guess. Um, the theatrical nature of the death of Arthur and the idea of the theatre as escape from reality, many um, representing to the modern world of um, mobile phones and um, and um, like social media and that world, I guess, the transition point here in A Midsummer Night's Dream, we are immediately catapulted 20 years into the post-pandemic world, which you could refer to as post-pandemic um, or post-apocalyptic either, or post-collapse is another term they use. Um, while King Lear was scheduled to be played, um, it actually they actually plague in Midsummer Night's Dream instead. So the chain to their symbolic of lightness, hope, connection, um, the warmth of the traveling symphony, symphony perhaps. Um, I just want you to think about the title and the significance of each section. So I'm going to talk you through starting from the beginning of um, part two, which is uh, chapter seven. So in contrast to the previous chapter, it's hot, uh, 41 degrees Celsius. In contrast to the snow we see at the last chapter, um, it's immediately apparent that the um, characters who were introduced to at the Travelling Symphony 20 years post-pandemic, there's an impression of danger that's created through the fact that um, they were walking through fraught territory. There's um, imagery of characters with weapons in hands, walking slowly. Um, and there, there is a sense that's created throughout Chapter 7 in particular of this brutality, the savagery, the danger of this new world. Um, and that is actually placed alongside, juxtaposed with this Shakespeare play. So this beauty of Shakespeare. So these two opposing concepts are placed together. And we find out that Kirsten, who was the little girl, one of the daughters in King Lear, when Arthur died, is actually here alive 20 years later. And she's part of the Travelling Symphony. And she has a memory, a flashback, a memory and a connection to the night where Arthur died. And so we see the first connection between the characters here. Um, and then we're introduced to a few other characters. We meet August, who is a close friend of hers. Um, and... Again, this sense of danger that's created, the fraught territory, the fact that they're looking for somewhere safe to put the children. Um, beautiful imagery of these trucks, these pickup trucks. So kind of like Australia, I guess we would call them like utes, large utes, um, but they've taken away the engines and the anything that would um, – be run on power or petrol has been taken away and it's actually horses that are pulling them um, and so uh, it's a great image to have there's got three horses three caravans um, and we learn that they um, there is a range of people in the symphony, including Deirdre and Alexandra, who's 15. They found her as a baby, um, young kid, Olivia, who's six. These characters aren't necessarily significant, but you can get a picture of the ages, the family feel, this sense of connection amongst the um, members of the Travelling Symphony. Um, just some other things that I noticed that I thought were worth um, uh, I'm highlighting the description or um, portrayal of the flu, Georgia flu, uh, that exploded like a neutron bomb. Uh, you may want to collect that quote as the impact of the pandemic, the um, collapse that followed and the unspeakable years where everyone was traveling, this horror of the first few years later, we learned that Kirsten has no memory of the year that she walked um, and the, there's a sense that many brutal things happened during that time and she's blocked it out. That's certainly the impression that I get um, 
and that would be reinforced through some of these descriptions of the unspeakable years. For example, um, we learn that the Travelling Symphony has existed um, since five years before the collapse and, and there's a bit of the history there. Um, apparently gasoline went stale um, by year three and so people had to walk and I really was like, hmm, I wonder if does gasoline petrol really go stale after three years? You can Google it if you're interested. I reckon um, Emily Mandela's probably um, checked that detail out, hopefully. Anyway, so they're travelling and they're travelling in North North America, so Lake Huron and Michigan. So that would be worth for some people looking up the map just so that you can get a visual of where that location is. They perform music, classical jazz, orchestra, pre-collapse pop songs and Shakespeare. So uh, remember that the travelling Shakespeare represent connection, they represent art, the beauty, creativity, um, and that idea of survival being insufficient, which we will touch on later. And uh, it's interesting that uh, they played some more modern plays in the first few years, but audiences seem to prefer Shakespeare over anything else. Um, and thought that was significant as this idea of the survival of culture, the longevity of culture, the legacy that is created, and this is the importance of art. Again, um, the savagery of the world is created through Kirsten, who's throwing knives at the tree. We actually imagine what sort of world does she live in that she has to practice throwing knives at a tree um, from further and further away. She has a memory, <clears throat> or they discuss the town they've recently left, Traverse City, where they met an inventor who rigged an electrical system and is looking for the internet. Um, and that idea of this sense of hope that maybe there's a civilization, um, the modern civilization, the world of electricity may still be out there or may be um, achievable. Um, and then Kirsten reflects that perhaps she doesn't really remember what a computer looked like, um, but she has a vague kind of idea of um, like a memory of electricity and a lamp that turned on. Um, when they search houses, so you can picture them going into abandoned houses, think like Walking Dead, um, they search out things and um, they look at the television screens, the blank television screens. August is looking for issues of the TV guide, um, television. Now, I mean, I, I question this. You might want to think about what it represents. Both of them kind of search for things that are futile in the modern world. Uh, sorry, the post-pandemic world, issues of the TV guide and um, Kirsten searches for um, celebrity gossip magazines because she's fascinated by Arthur Leander in particular. Again, uh, who's um, a celebrity who's dead and um, the um, world of celebrities, which obviously doesn't exist anymore. So um, how you interpret that, this futile hope, blind hope or perhaps yearning for the days of old or perhaps something completely different. You might think about what that represents. Um, and we start to see the connections between the characters here. Um, she remembers Arthur who gave her the comic books, which um, the Station Eleven comic books with the main character, Dr. Eleven, um, and these comic books become a motif because of the way that they connect Arthur and Miranda and later on Tyler the Prophet as well. Um, so thing to note here, despite Arthur's death in the opening chapter of the novel, he is a central figure in the narrative. He draws all of the tales and the characters together. Chapter 8. Um, chapter 8, um, there is a summary of the comics. So it moves from the description of the comics and the memory of her uh, receiving the comics to a description of the comics. Um, 
and that Dr. Eleven, who is a physicist on a space station. Um, it's really worth looking at the symbolism of the parallel stories of Dr. Eleven and Station Eleven alongside the post-pandemic world. Um, and later on, there's another chapter where we'll look at that in more detail. But um, it is important also that it is not necessarily a a mass-produced comic, but somebody's vanity project, which reinforces that significance of art again because the topic uh, copy two of ten top copy three of ten maybe there's only ten copies of these books in the world um the notice the connection with miranda who we know is the author um the author which can be seen um she in chapter five remember she's looking out over the boats um the ships and here in chapter eight, um, Dr. Eleven is standing looking out over the boats. And one of the um, things that um, Mandel does throughout the novel is actually show how Miranda's experience shaped the creation of Dr. Eleven's story. And we can see that Miranda places herself in the um, center as the hero of that story and, and as Dr. Eleven, and that becomes apparent later on too. The dog's name is Luli. Miranda's dog's name is Luli. And the prophet's dog's name is Luli. Just something to keep an eye out. This quote, I stood out looking over my damaged home and tried to forget the sweetness of life on earth. Perhaps true of the post-collapse world. Also definitely a significant quote. Um, chapter 9, we see that something is not right as they arrive in uh, St. Deborah. They're actually arrived here looking for um, Charlie and the sixth guitar, so Charlie and Jeremy. Charlie um, is pregnant with a baby and they left them, her there last time they came through. The Travelling Sympathy came through um, to have the baby. They've come back to perform but also to pick up Charlie and the sixth guitar. Um but immediately there is a sense of fear, tension and isolation that's created by Mandel through the narrative here um, and the change that from the last time that they were here. Um, the music this time brings no onlookers. Only four or five people even come to their doors. They can't find Charlie. She doesn't seem to be anywhere. Um, this town is too empty um, from Kirsten's narrative perspective there. Um, and they were going to, they've been rehearsing Leah, they were going to perform Leah, but they suggest instead that they're going to to main summer night stream instead. The evening calls for fairies. There's a sense of they need some humor. They need some lightness. There's something about the depressing world that they, the depressing St. Deborah that they want to actually bring light to perhaps. Um, and they continue with the sense of um, maybe unease, disease. Hmm. Um, the sense of disquiet might be another word you might use there. Um, and of St. Deborah, the irony, don't forget the irony that um, Saeed and Dieter, sorry, Saeed and Kirsten are playing two lovers over on in Tartania and on screen they are fighting lovers and off screen they are also fighting lovers. Um, that um, Kirsten has cheated on um, on Saeed out of boredom more or less. Uh, so on and off stage uh, life par mirrors or parallels art. Um, you might remember when we studied um, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream back in year nine, some of the themes from that play that we can uh, remember and see here. Um, chapter 10, the interconnections. Um, so this chapter, pretty much from here all the way to here, it um, reflects the or represents the conflict because the Travelling Symphony, they live together, uh, perform together 
uh, travel together 365 days a year. And so um, you'll find some quotes there about the individuals and um, the complex dynamics with the relationships. And so um, the interweaving of all of that, it's quite beautiful. I encourage you to have a look at it, but that purpose is that. But then there's this beautiful section at the bottom here, which I think is worth noting. Um, so as they, there's these, collection of petty jealousies, neuroses, undiagnosed, undiagnosed PTSD, simmering resentments. They lived together, traveled together, rehearsed together, performed together. Um, um, 365 days of the year. Um, what made it bearable was their friendships, the camaraderie, the music, and the Shakespeare, these moments of transcendent beauty and joy. Okay, so that significance of warmth, uh, connection, um, that is really important to note. I think that's a key theme of Mandel that she's trying to highlight. Um, and then, um, again, we continue on the next page with the significance, page 48, 49. Um, survival in particularly as they go about their post-pandemic life um, and the changes from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic life you'll see um, and on page 49 um, I certainly paid attention to um, the symbol of the lowercase t with a li extra line towards the bottom I don't actually know what that looks like I can't imagine it because later on they say it looks like a plane. We know later we discovered that that's the prophet's mark. Um, so I'm imagining it looks something like this, but I don't think it looks anything like a plane. So I really, maybe you have a different idea of what it looks like, um, but we definitely have a sense that something really bad has happened with the town um, and that it is now unsafe. Um Kirsten meets somebody that she knew from before. She remembers she's looking for Charlie and Jeremy um, and the lady who knew her from before, um, Maria, um, warns her to go as soon as possible, leave here as quickly of, as possible. Um, notice that the prophet represents fear, control and isolation. Um, and... Um, yes, so over page 53, you'll notice that Deirdre has found unmarked, um, has found graves. So grave markers, they're not unmarked graves, sorry, they're grave markers. So they've actually um, have uh, pre-buried graves, pre-put uh, grave markers for Charlie, for Jeremy and for the baby Annabelle and um, this is another example of the control fear that the prophet is um, trying to establish. There is this idea that it's a threat of future death. Um, half the graves are actual graves. Others of them are just markers driven into a flat surface. And so it is like a threat of um, if you come back here, you uh, will be killed perhaps, or you are dead to us either, or you may interpret it how you will. I think it's definitely clear that it's if you come back here, you're dead and you are dead to us. Um, so um, they talked about the grave markers with the rest of the traveling symphony. Um, and they discovered that yes, there is a prophet um, and in chapter 11, keep moving on. Um, I love this quote at the top. What is lost in the collapse? Almost everything, almost everyone, but there is still such beauty um, and the beauty of twilight. Um, and I think that's a theme that you'll see many times and um, how Midsummer Night's Dream in this chapter performed in Twilight adds to this idea of beauty and that concept that art continues to be of value in a world where there is such a calamity that purpose, art, creativity, beauty, 
um, humanity will prevail. Um, so they perform, note the um, lines of the play um, are from um, Titania and Oberon's fight, referring to Said and um, Kirsten's relationship, but also the symbolism of the weather. Um, in the play itself, Titania and Oberon are actually influencing the weather by their fight, their fairies and their magic influences the weather. Um, that, that is perhaps symbolic of uh, the power of emotions to influence, influence people around them. Um, Shakespeare himself was a victim. Shakespeare wasn't a victim. Shakespeare's three siblings were victims and his son was a victim of the plague, bubonic plague. Um, so the illusion of say, Shakespeare, so Shakespeare's plays. These, um, the literary technique where we refer to one text inside another is called illusion. So the illusion of Shakespeare's, um, the significance of, the, of Shakespeare's illusion um, in terms of the plague symbol is important he symbolizes survival and the fact that great art can come from great tragedy and then the motif uh, quote key theme survival is insufficient which is on the traveling symphony caravans um so the they all have sorry, Travelling Symphony, but the lead caravan has because survival is insufficient. And that is a quote from Star Trek Voyager. Um, and it, I would consess, I would make a case that it's one of the key themes of the novel um, that survival is insufficient. Human beings need purpose, connection, love, hope, identity, belonging. Um, note the, um, the perhaps the season's altering, foreshadowing, coming change, which is coming in, indeed. Chapter 12, significance of uh, the prophet who, everyone gives them a standing ovation, but there is a man, we know he is the prophet, who alone sits in a chair, um, the prophet representing isolation, whereas the Travelling Symphony represent connection. Um, and then he goes and he... Um, goes on this oratory where he just is filled with rhetoric with um you'll see not lots of persuasive language devices if you wanted to do a language analysis of it um but you can clearly see that he is a little insane um he's um using um basically explaining that the um, flu was a, um, a punishment of the gods, God, he, um, not the gods, God, 99.9%, um, 99% of people died, only one's left out of it, 150, 250, 300. He calls it a such a perfect agent of death, was a cleansing of the earth. Um, and so rather than the idea that it just happened because it happened, um, it was unlucky or that he's actually asserting that some sort of divine plan and that he or we are the light, the pure. Um, so um, then um, I want you to note, though, that in the midst of this crazy rhetoric, um, Mandel is clearly condemning this type of thinking, um, this type of absolutist extremist thinking. And partly the way that she's condemning it is the fact that um, throughout the whole novel, you only ever see the uh, prophet Tyler through the eyes of other people. So we talked about the fact that it's a third person um, omniscient narration. It does drop into the perspective of other characters, but we actually never drop into Tyler at all. We get a sense of his uh, damaged upbringing, um, but we really don't have an idea of what he goes through. So we're not, we don't feel sympathy for him. There's nothing created like that. We actually do get to see him as an antagonist because of the uh, the, the the way that he's positioned out um, separately or um, away from, narratively away from others. Um, and so uh, he, he makes these statements. He declares that the funerals are held and they're dead to us. Um, the 
the grave markers refers to them. We find out that the dog's Lily um, and the conductor, they decide to go straight away. It's a cult, a doomsday cult. They, re, they um, when Kirsten asks, um, what did he say when he speaks in, um, so the conductor asks him something and we don't find out the detail, but later um, the conductor says that she wanted, he wanted Alexandra, the 15-year-old girl, to be the next bride. Um, he's already got multiple brides. It's, we just get this real sense of damage, harm, um, danger, and destruction through the fear, the tension that's in the town. And, yes, so they get on their way within minutes. They pack up and just leave. Um, there is a sentry, a guard there, who's asking, do you have permission to leave? Um, they're saying when people leave without permission, they have funerals. Um, well, if they've already had a funeral, when people come back, we know that they're probably going to be killed. Um, there's a couple of them that want to, um, the boy says, can you take me with you? Um, but they don't because they're fearful that that would invite um, a retaliation from the prophet. Um, there's, as they leave, um, as they leave, there is some imagery of um, flowers and pine and some, you know, calm imagery, sense of perhaps hope or perhaps the calm before the storm. Um, right at the end of this section, um, we see them deciding how they're going to go, where they're going to go, and they actually decide they're going to make their way to this former airport in Severn City. And um, inside Kirsten's backpack, we see that there is, um, amongst other things, there's a bottle of water, there is... Um, a sweater, a rag in case of going into dusty homes. She's got all these things that are necessary. The tabloid connection, collection, Dr. Eleven comics, and the paperweight. And there's a description of the paperweight here. And this paperweight, um, which is the first time it's mentioned here, it's small, the size of a plum, um, no practical use, dead weight in the bag, but she keeps it because she finds it beautiful, um, representing that idea of um, the need for beauty in the world that perhaps has no purpose other than to enrich the lives of people because of the meaning, purpose, life, etc. And even the clippings, I think, are worth thinking about why does she keep this, these shadows from the former world, the time before Georgia flew, um, but um, no, like, no connection to the new world. Um, and it ends this section um, looking where um, Kirsten is looking at a picture of Arthur with his arm around his first wife, Miranda, and that's about to become a segue or link to this new section, section three, set in the pre-pandemic timeline. And that is the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Phew. All right.